Listener Production. G'day, it's Rusty here, all set for part two of my podcast with Marty and Blair, who's better known as Moog, from Mighty Car Mods. They don't use words like YouTube sensation, but they really are. A couple of self-taught Aussies doing cool car projects and telling those stories to a huge worldwide audience. We actually teed this chat up while at a racetrack in South Australia recently, where they turned up with some hot hatches. Hey everybody, I've got a Mark 8 Golf R. And I have a GR Garris. These are two of the most exciting all-wheel drive turbocharged hatchbacks on the market today. Absolutely, and wouldn't it be awesome if you could take them for a bit of a thrash? (laughs) Yes! You can actually see that full vid by going to mightycarmods.com or just search for them on YouTube. Now, if you've arrived at this point of the chat and you haven't heard part one, jump back to the Rusty's Garage Library and give it a listen. You'll learn about a shared love of music and the serious talent they have there, making voice on hold messages to pay for tyres in the early days and starting to make videos on modifying and building project cars on the family driveway before the internet really even clicked up a gear. We begin part two with that moment of realisation that obsession is about to become occupation. I remember the moment um, so clearly like it was yesterday for me. It was probably different for each of us. I'll tell you what my moment was, is that we had, through whatever social media we must have had around that time, the show was still not monetized. we said, um, if you really like the show, let's do a meetup. So fan meetups on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and whatever is a popular thing now, but we said, we, we were aware that those numbers were real people. Each of those numbers was a human and we were kind of like, we want to try and connect with those people. And so I think it was, was it Homebush Mighty or Silverwater? We basically organized a meet and we said, you know, let's, if you like the show and you want to come along, come along at this place, two o'clock or something. I remember we parked the car and we walked along and this is this weird, um, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm getting the feeling now just remembering it of parking the car and walking along and seeing a small group of people over there and then going to Marty, oh my God, like... There's how many people were there, Marty? Twelve people, maybe? No, I think what, maybe twenty. Maybe twenty yeah, people. It's decent. And we we're like, wow, these people have come out. And I remember walking along, and I stopped as we we're walking towards them, and I was saying to Marty, like, what do I, what do I do? Like, like, what do I say to them? I don't like. They're strangers. I, yeah. Am I like, hi, I'm Blair. I do music, and we do some YouTube on the weekend, or, or hey, it's Moog. We're here to do a thing, or whatever. And Marty says, I oh, mean, you just be yourself and I was like well I guess that makes sense and so then a kid got the first person that I met the first fan was someone who brought a child a kid to them and uh, and who was maybe like seven or eight years old and he came up and he goes hi Moog I love the show and I was like thanks man that's awesome and I was like they're not here to go oh hey guys it's just something we do on the side and oh we're not really it's like they're really excited about enthusiastic and I went well I'm enthusiastic and excited so that's just that's That's how I'm going to approach it. And so going and meeting these people and shaking their hands and them saying, we love your videos, there's nothing else like it. And they really saw us as champions of the Mm. cheap. So at that time, you know, you've got Top Gear and supercars driving all around the place. We're playing around with Daihatsus, Nissan Pulsars. And they were like, someone's finally celebrating the stuff that we're into. Because even V8 supercars and things like that and TCR, they might be seen formula one is out of reach for a lot of people when you see a couple of people who are genuinely excited about daihatsu's nissan's sylvia's cheaper golfs and stuff like that people are like well this is this is our people this is our Mm. thing and so for a lot of people they took us really really seriously and they went these are the guys who are championing normal cars and normal people and certainly my intention was to celebrate normal stuff Mm. and normally people go oh no you don't do that it has to be special it has to be this i didn't think it was because again like marty was saying the car was a ticket to the adventure it wasn't about the Mm. car it was about where it could take you and certainly when i got my license i remember saying to my mum, or maybe it was before i got my l's when i get my license where am i allowed to drive and she said you're allowed to go anywhere you can go free to where you Mm. can just get in a car and go i just i couldn't believe it and so i realized for a lot of people particularly those that didn't have their licenses they were looking at us 
as people who are showing them that when you got your license, you don't need to get a WRX or a Turbo Commodore or anything like that. You can get a normal car and have some fun, and that's what I think they were excited about, and that's what I was excited about. But that's when I was like, it's real. Yeah, and in terms of the um, coming back maybe to the platform, which I'm sound like a broken record, but uh, th- we, we've mentioned the word monetized a few times. The truth was, even up to that point, it was costing us quite a bit of money Dude, to yeah. make the thing. So we started thinking about, you know, like you would with a band, okay, do we make some shirts or some stickers? And in the very, very early days, people would like send us an email, and then I'd just send them a free sticker, and they stick it on their car, and it was like advertising. But then there was a point where it shifted and we're like okay we, maybe we should you know ask people for five bucks for the sticker and people were really receptive to it and also come back to the thing I said about being on dial up modem back then if you wanted to watch the entire series of season one of Mighty Carmels or season two which is about the time we're mm-hmm. talking about you'd probably burn your entire year worth of internet <laughs> download yeah. quota so we would be burning DVDs. Um, I'd burn them in the you know downstairs room of my mum's house, and we'd you know print them on the printer and package them up and send them away. And you know we're sending a couple of them out a week, whatever it was. But that did because at one point we needed a new camera, and they're about two grand. And we managed to buy the second camera. So you know the first one was bought with your own budget, and then the second one we did manage to put the money together to do it. And there was a point where YouTube had the option of you know we can run mm. ads on the front of the video, and we thought maybe there'd be some huge pushback and. We said no for a long, yeah, long we, time. Yeah, we sort of resisted that and went, no, let's try not to do that in case people sort of get really turned off by it. But in the end, people were really receptive and I think there was, was an understanding and still is to a point that, um, that you know, this stuff costs it's, money, cars cost money, making making the show costs money and that, that needs to be paid for. So it was never about, oh, let's try and, you know, get as much margin as we can. It was like, let's just cover the cost so we can do this and not have to, you know, work to do it, basically. Do you think, though, Marty, that when you're kind of burning the DVDs and sending them off... Did you get a sense of like, it's a thing now? Because certainly when you get a piece of merchandise, a sticker, a t-shirt if you're in a band or you're making some stuff on Etsy and you're sending it out, I think that sending that first thing out to someone that you don't Mm. know is so exciting and is definitely an indication of maybe you're doing something right. Yeah, yeah, it's um absolutely. It was a it's it's a good feeling, but also yeah, coming back to, you know, the meets if we did we did a couple more and it's just it's always the enthusiasm and so that's that's what the 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 surroundings were for me anyway that there's just generally a lot of people really enthusiastic about it it was a fun amount of stuff for our to do we were capable of doing it it wasn't ruining mm-hmm. our lives with too much workload or anything it was just at a, at a really nice point and we've tried to keep it that way even through the years where it's not all consuming because the the appetite mm-hmm. is endless the the you know that thirst can never be quenched for the general internet's you know want for content so people like make more videos you can make a video you can make three videos in a week and you'll get hundreds of people going make more it's like it's physically impossible so the whole time trying to keep that balance has been a a good reason why we're still here and still doing it and still enjoying it because i think too many people burn out marty that kind of leads me to i mean that word you used there a moment ago balance right i I would imagine when it gets to the stage where it is now you you need extra hands to help make things happen from from merchandise to video creation to to even just um coming up with with ideas and and concepts right but what's integral to this is you two so is there an element of of keeping that simplicity so it stays that way as well even though you need help around the edges for sure. Well, it's at the end of it, it's really just, it is mostly us is two, um, not to discount the help that we do have. We've got a couple of really good mates. Like, I've got a nice circle of mates that always offer to help. Some guys are good at cameras, some guys are good at electronics, some guys, guys are, are good at various things. A, a really good mate of ours, um, Gav, has done our motion graphics since the mm-hmm. beginning, um, and he just always does it, and he's, he's really into his cars too. But um, the core of it, those videos, yeah, the videos go through Marty and I only... As their final stage, regardless of if Marty does the rough edit or I do it or whatever, it will go from us on our own personal edit machine to watch through. I'll do the music for it. Marty will check it. We'll upload it. We make the thumbnail. That aspect is us. So in terms of the video creation, we've had people that have helped come and film stuff because we used to be do a race on the racetrack and there's no one to film it. So now we, we have some camera people that we can call in to help us film that and help assemble and wrangle the data. But in terms of... No one else then gets it, edits, edits it all, writes the script. We go on this episode, whatever, and then we just have a look at it. The videos themselves are going up. Where we've needed help is logistics, for example. So, like, we need to get to a racetrack and we need to get cars there. So, there's a towing company that we use that can help us with that. Um, quite often, if a, a, a movie, we've, we've worked on franchises like Fast and Furious, Transformers, um, 
Mad Max, Fury Road, things like that. They say, we want you to do something to help us, and we go, great. And we say, yeah, of course we'll do it. That sounds fun. And then they send you a contract that's like really – and it's, it's beyond – I did one semester of arts law, but it's beyond what we can do. And so a lot of the mm. time – as actually being spent with trying to work out how we can be as creative as possible, have all of the creative control, but then also when a film company comes and says, hey, can you come to LA and build a car and you want to do it, also do that. And so I would say, for me anyway, because you know originally I was kind of like trying to handle the sponsorship yep. stuff while Marty was handling all of the data wrangling, it was kind of a huge bit of the time was just doing the legal stuff because when you're working with big companies, any big companies really, you want to make sure that you're doing mm. it right and that you're serving their needs and mm. your own. You know, we, we did an event together very recently at, uh, at the Bend in South Australia and I could see some joy on both your faces on some cars that you, you brought there. As all this intense hard work goes into and, and very passionately into building this, this huge thing, Thing, what was the moment where you both treated yourself to a car, the car along the way that you went, I've earned that? I'll go Good. first. Uh, I'll go first. My favourite vehicle, like of all time, any vehicle, one, two, three, four or more wheels, is a Honda CT110 Posty bike. I think that is the ultimate utilitarian vehicle for the money that can get you around. You can carry stuff. You can have adventures. You can get places. They're cheap. You can fix them yourself. If the carby goes, you can get a rebuild kit for $9 or a whole new carby for $29. And so when I felt like I'd really made it, which I think was last year, <laughs> Honda released a... Um, a Honda 125, so the same car but with an upgraded yep. engine, the big engine. And um, and I said to Marty, I'm going to do something I've never done before. I'm going to buy one brand new, seven grand. And I was like, I'm just going to do it. I'm <laughs> just, just going to go. I do, talked like, about it for so long. Should I'm I do so it? Sorry. Should I not do it? I'm so sorry. And I and I bought it, and um and it's just and it's just brand new. And I was just like. This thing is the best, and it felt so opulent. It, felt, you know, we weren't off like buying Lambos, and, you know, doing whatever. It was I bought I bought a posty bike, and to me that was that was a representation of a lot of hard work. And I'm buying a brand new thing, and I'm just going to enjoy it, and I still have it, and I'll never sell it. I just think it's the best. So my story is a little bit different. My <laughs> story is a bit different, and I did sell it, and it is the most fanciest, ballerest car I've ever owned. And I'm really glad I did it. And it definitely fine-tuned where all my interests are in cars. So, Oh, no, you're going for it. Yeah, you're so, exposing it. Have oh, we fine. ever spoken about this car before? I don't know we have. This is a scoop, maybe. It's time. No, but this is good because I had... um. What, what did I have at the time? So I had my, my, my couple of nuggets that I'll never sell. So I got a little Daihatsu mirror four-wheel drive thing. We drove it around. We, we bought it in Japan as scrap, brought it back to Australia, reshelled this car, did this massive thing. Fans will know what I'm talking about. Then we also, you asked a question earlier about was there a car you regret selling? One of the early cars we did in season one was a Nissan March Super Turbo, a little white hatchback yeah. with a one-liter four-cylinder turbo and supercharged engine. Really unique. At the time, I needed a wagon for my band, so I sold that Super Turbo and bought a Subaru. Regret. I did regret it. <laughs> 12 years later or more, uh, this guy finds one in Japan and doesn't tell me. And then we go to Japan and he and we actually, he bought another one, which was amazing. I bought him one. It's the one that got away. Awesome. You know, the one that got away. And, so. I, and I found one in Japan and I just bought it for him. So that's... um Because I'm a nice bloke. That's pretty awesome. It cost more than my posty bike. It so. did. A little, a little bit more than your posty bike. So anyway, so that's another one I'll never sell. And uh, so I got these crappy cars. But, you know, in a real world, you also need a thing. We spoke about dual cabs, ute, utes being really useful. And that's what I had. I had a Ford Ranger. And um and I, I was doing some Renaults and whatever and, and it sort of just didn't need it anymore. And I'm like, what's... And I had that, that feeling like, what's a car I've always like just dreamed of owning something really cool, really awesome, really nice. What am I going to do? And I'm, I'm like, RS4. Everyone talks about them. I love station awesome. wagons. Let's go there. It's V8. It's all drive. There's nothing better than that. It revs like crazy. I'm not really into Euro cars, but I'm like, let's let's just do it. Let's go there. So I actually traded my Ranger and and it, the, the RS4 was... Re pretty much equivalent to the value. So it was a second-hand one. It was like... But a V8 wagon... 10 years old. That's pretty cool. And I was like, I'm like this... And as I'm driving, I'm like, well, this is the fanciest thing this is ever. Like, this is this is really cool. And um, and it was a great experience. I enjoyed it. I realised pretty quickly there's not much you can do to modify it, which for us is a big thing. If you can't modify them or, or ex explore that area more, it's like, it's a good thing. And I appreciate why people like buying them and driving them. But I was like... Okay, I'm done. And I have no interest whatsoever in ever buying anything like that ever again. <laughs> not a RS6, not a Lamb, not nothing. Like, I don't need a supercar. I feel like I got close with a, you know, European, you know, high revving V8 thing with lots of power. Mm. And I really enjoyed the experience, but like, I'll be back in nuggets I can modify and, and really get 
get to where I want them. So I only owned it for probably six months and I think I sold it for more than I paid. Rusty, what are you driving around in at the moment or what is in your fleet, if I can use the word fleet? I, I am a terrible family man at the moment. We have a little bit of, um, not too much, a couple of acres of space. So I have a, a Navara SDX for running around. My wife has a, a GLA 254 Matic. Uh, a couple of years old, cool. and uh, my youngest daughter has just started driving, so she's in a 116 Sport oh. BMW, so I'm going through all that that stuff at the moment. But I need to come back to Moog's point about uh, Honda CT110. I don't, I'm, I've said on the podcast no, a number of times, I don't believe in regret, but if there was one regret, I had one, I had it all, Mint CT110, I think it was 2007 model, and I sold it before we moved. So that would be regret. And she was a beauty too, mate, uh-huh. just bulletproof. Luckily, Absolutely bulletproof. they're plentiful yes. and uh, you can... <laughs> You, you can always get one, mate. You you j- jump on Marketplace or whatever or Gumtree. They're, they're always there. They're not going anywhere. We actually pulled one apart back in like 2000 and I want to say 2009 or 10 because we are going to like do a big block conversion. And the 140cc. The, the parts we got didn't fit, whatever. So that thing stayed in parts in my mum's garage for like a decade. Yep. And then I reckon it would have been 2020 or 2021. So yeah, nearly, nearly 10 years later. We put it back together and it started first kick. Awesome. I do have... My, it's amazing. From from pieces. From parts. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am being, um, to your point, uh, harassed by my buddy Greg Murphy, who's a four-time Bathurst winner, to get a project car. He's at me at the moment to do something. And he has... He's a neighbour, not too far from me. Uh, he has a... a uh, a Datsun 1200 and a, a Mark II Ford Escort and I very occasionally sneak around there and steal the keys boys for um, for they're both being restored well you too. don't need your no. own then yeah. you don't need your own project <laughs> car if your mate's got one <laughs> But here we are. Stay with us as we head around the world and then back to the super garage with the boys from Mighty Car Mods. Hey, can we talk crazy overseas um, adventures and the one that stands out for you? And I, like I, you know, I looked very fondly when you got to drive that that rare JDM 240Z, for example. I mean, there must have been some very cool ones that stick in your mind. Yeah, uh, look, we've we've been to, you know, we've had lots of adventures in Japan buying really cheap cars. We bought the cheapest Golf GTI in Germany and drove that over the place. And the, but the the uh, the adventure that stands out to me that the most was when we went to Cuba as part of the Fast and Furious franchise. Yeah. So we were basically there to shoot a documentary about Havana, um, which I believe was going to be included on the on the on the DVD as like a bonus or a special or something like that. And we we had some budget to go there. And what I loved about that is there was very much this sense ability of you just make your car work and you get to where you need to get to no matter what and so there's people swapping in water pumps as the, as engines for their cars. Toyota high ace van engines in classic American cars, <laughs> yep. Bel Airs and stuff. People pulling engines out by putting a rope over a branch in a tree and pulling and it down. And you know why they had those engines? Because Russia bought a lot of them and they could import from Russia but not anywhere else. Yeah. And it was just, it was amazing. And then they have these Frankenstein cars where the front half of the car is useless because maybe it's had an accident. So that goes. The back half of that one, they weld these things together, but the panels don't even match. They just kind of make it work. And that to me was just mind blowing because we can go, I'm going to modify a car. I'll put an air filter on it and put some lowered springs Mm -hmm. on it. They're modifying a car. Let's get a van and a hatchback, cut them in half, weld them together, put a water pump engine in the back to run it and take the kids to school. It was amazing. And remember they were dangling out like Coke bottles full of petrol, like holding it up outside the window so that they could get enough gravity to push it through the car when you get it to <laughs> yeah. go. You drive along holding your fuel in your hand. I mean, that was an amazing, uh, amazing adventure. You can, I think the, the video is called The Cars of Cuba, Mighty Car Mods. You can find that. And to me, that was the most eye-opening because of course we can say oh we we went to the uae and drove a supercar we did or we drove these classic cars and those things but i think seeing just that sheer ingenuity and passion for cars was beyond anything i'd ever experienced up till 2019 when when COVID hit obviously that changed everything in terms of travel um we've been to japan a couple of times partly because you know we have so many japanese cars in the market here in australia and also their bargains and also there's no jet lag and also it's only eight hours away and also there's a total massive culture flip Mm. like you know if you go from here to the uk you look around and go okay there's the same you know products on the shelf you go to japan it's completely different and they're quite receptive to having guests there which is really cool so some of the adventures we've had in japan have been great mostly because we go there only having a rough idea of what might happen 
and that's we have where point some a of the and point B, don't we? Yeah, that's, that's where some of the the joy and, and some of the most fun stuff we've done yeah. and some of the best results is just going. We don't know what's going to happen, and you know, we we spoke to a, a guy who'd contacted us, and he said, "I know a car dealer, and he might have something out the back." And then we go there, and there's like this little Daihatsu sitting in a pile of rubbish for three hundred bucks, it. and and we bought it and had an adventure with it, and eventually now I drive it around. Like it's 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 some of those adventures have been very memorable, and people seem to really like those films too. You know, they've got. They, they go for most of them go for over an hour and they've got millions of views on them and there is no script and no plan Love when it. we do our overseas we take one person as a camera person to help yep. us um, to help us shoot and sometimes we'll have a local there who's a driver or who can speak Japanese to help us and we will fly into the place pick up whatever car we bought off the internet and we'll say why don't we drive it to Tokyo that is it there is no oh and on the way we'll stop here and here and here we drive along see interesting things we stop most of them make it to the edit, some don't, but there are no story points or script. Now we pretend to break down. <laughs> now we're going to pretend we don't know this guy. Now we're going to pretend we modify it. Like, none of that. It just is real. And I think, again, people just really like it because it's just, you know, maybe it's not as exciting as a Top Gear special where they might turn a car into a tank or do something, but, you know, and they say, I did this last night and it's it's pretty clear it didn't happen exactly. last night, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, anyway. Yeah, overseas travel's good, opens the brain. Awesome. Um, Super Garage. Tell people a bit more about this. I mean, uh, this is kind of the the culmination, the realisation of of, uh, all this incredible hard work. And to think you can have it, um, you know, all these years later, just tremendous. Uh, this story, uh, this story doesn't start there. It starts at my chiropractor. <laughs> uh, no, we, we, we. Um, anyone knows who's crawled around under cars on concrete floors for long enough, and in my case, yeah, twenty more than twenty years. Um, it just ergonomically, it's not great, and also limits what you can do because uh, you know every mechanic workshop you ever see has a hoist so that you can access things and lift things and, and do bigger projects, and so. Um, for a long time, we wanted to get a hoist, but our space our space is pretty small, and it's got like a suspended slot or something. There's some reason that we couldn't put a hoist there. It can fit two cars in. Yeah, a lot of can. people, when they visit the space here, they say, I can't believe it's so small. You can have one car with enough room to walk around and work on it, or two cars with not enough room to work around it. And we'd always thought, imagine having some more space, because we have to shoot our videos in series and by in series, I mean this car, you have to keep working on it till it's done and then move it out. And so if Marty's saying, I want to pull a car apart and it's going to take three weeks, we say, well, that means there's no videos for three weeks. So we've got to put it on Gojax. And it just became a really inefficient way of making videos. And so, um, yeah, obviously anyone who's worked on cars loves the idea of, of a workshop space where you've got a bit more room. And, um, and some space became available, so we, we jumped at it because it meant there was a spot for a hoist. Um, there's room for probably yeah, eight or nine cars if you really squashed them in, but in terms of just working on stuff, it really opens up what we're able mm. to do. So design that space, um, tooled it up and, and went for it. The floor is way more grotty than it was when we got there. That's what I know. So it's been very productive and, yeah, love having that area to do it. And the the walls are all painted in uh, the walls are painted in the colours of some of our favourite yep. vehicles. So the walls are two forty Z white. We've had Excellent. that matched, and there's two racing stripes. And one of the racing stripes is uh, blue, which is Excellent. Uh, yeah, which is Subaru blue. And there's a red stripe, which of course, Rusty, it's Honda CT one ten red. So that's a stripe <laughs> that goes around the whole thing. And so it just uh, nice. And so really, what Super Garage was for is there's a car in there at the moment that we've been working on for maybe six mm. months. Um, our audience hasn't seen that yet, but it means that we can go and pick away at it, get people to come and help us, uh, and then we can come back to Mighty Car Mods and kind of do our uh, quicker turnaround videos. Like tomorrow here. night, like there's ten of our mates coming over to help us blow apart a car we need some parts from. Just it's the right space to do that kind of thing. Excellent. It's really good. Excellent. Yeah. So fast forward from a couple of blokes going to their their first meet with uh, with fans in, in Homebush there to. You know, now the millions of followers that you have, the the blue chip auto organisations that you have as partners, getting phone calls from the likes of Mad Max, um, you know, and, and more. Pretty wild, boys, isn't it? How do you go when some of those first phone calls came through? Or, um, g'day, Fast and Furious here. <laughs> We've got an idea. <laughs> uh, Universal yeah, Studios, yeah. it was, wasn't it? Well, in, a lot of the time we would go, how big can we make it? How awesome can we make it? Because I think if you're if you're an influencer whose job is to turn up somewhere, you know, go to the red carpet and we'll give you... Ten, I guess you can buy a nice mm. dress or do whatever. But what we kind of went is that... Uh, Hollywood companies have got budget. We're like, what can we do that's bigger than what we could normally do? And so the excitement was... um I understood why people were contacting us. You know, if if you're getting 
three, four, five million views a week and 25% of them are Australian, you go, oh, there's 700,000 Australians or a million Australians or whatever. I understand, the, I understand they're going, how can we access that? And so a lot of the people that were contacting us in the early days, of course, was alcohol and gambling, which is a huge... Um, there's a huge advertising push to try and get Australian males and we're a 98.5% mm. male audience. And so Marty and I had to sit down in the very early days. We didn't want to have to sit down and discuss every time, what happens if Fast and Furious call? What happens if Foster's call? What happens if this? And so we kind of went, let's just let's just make some blanket rules. We, do, we won't do alcohol and gambling. So let's just, we both agreed on that, done. We've never spoken about it ever since. Um, and in terms of sponsors and brands, we go, we should be working with brands that we believe are the best at what it is that they do. So if someone comes along and it's Johnny's car wash and you use it and it's not that good and he goes, I'll sponsor you. If we don't use it, we don't have a history and we don't think it's that good, we just mm. won't do it. And we get many, we get contact from lots of companies that want that want to do a sponsorship and we don't do it because what we do know is that when we use the product and we know the product is good, we know that the audience will trust us and we know that they'll go and, you know, and buy it and try it and we don't want to be responsible for them using something that's terrible. That naturally leads me because I, I, I think uh, that kind of that kind of synergy, that right connection, um, a lot of good stuff that you're doing as reach out ambassadors, right? Because um, mental health is a is a is a big thing, and I and I think being around cars for for people, not not just just blokes, to to have that um, that thing, that project, that whatever. I mean, it's so important, guys, isn't it? It, well, really, it really is. I think I think yeah. we're wired for that. Just to touch on your project thing, I think um, a lot of people connect with it on that level because not having no project. You know, people talk about purpose, right? Like, what's what's the purpose? And it, it sounds you know, silly in some ways. Oh, it's just a car. It doesn't mean anything. It's oh, it can. You know, like the experiences you have with it. You know, it's a good excuse to get your mates around. As you know, you can sit there in a room and what do you talk about? But suddenly there's a broken car there, and you know, use your mind and your mm-hmm. skills and and your abilities and and try and help each other out. And I think that ha- that has quite a powerful effect for people, especially if they're struggling. And so we do hear from a lot of people that will say that it's like, oh, you know, it was really inspirational to to see what you guys did and it got me inspired to work on my thing which I hadn't worked on for a while I got some mates over and you know it's been a really good experience and we probably you'll hear from people all the time saying mm. that kind of thing good stories bad stories but generally like a lot of um yeah a lot of positivity I think when you work in a space with other people and you work on a project that can become a little bit of a microcosm mm. really of life and anything that you can achieve something positive and something of value I think will spread out to other parts of your life as well I think when you're having a really rough time maybe you lose your job then you paint your house and then it rains oh of course it's raining because I just paint it can feel like the world's against you it can feel like there's an actual program that is set up to make life difficult for you and when you can start having some wins you and and for me sometimes it's trying to undo a bolt that's in a really hard to reach place and one of our friends, you know, who's a mechanic that'll help us, sometimes I'll just say, do you want me to grab it for you? And I'll go, no, even if it takes me 15 minutes and I cut myself <laughs> up, you know, on my knuckles by reaching around and doing whatever, anyone that's played with cars knows that, I want to do it as well because I just want that experience of going, it was really difficult, it. sometimes mm-hmm. it hurts, but I'm going to try and achieve it. And and when you do that, then you go outside and instead of going, it's raining on my new house, you go, oh, it's actually raining on the lawn. That's a good thing. You, you can start to see the world in a better way when you have little moments of positivity and success. Um, and Sometimes, though, you've got to make, you've got to actively make those situations yourself because it is easy, particularly if you're not feeling great, to sit down and just go, the world's a horrible place. There's lots of horrible people. I'm safer if I just stay mm. here. But actually going out and going for a walk, fixing your bike, doing, starting a project, I think can help you realise that you can have wins Definitely. still. Boys, a couple to finish. You've been super good with your time, which we really appreciate. Um, if you don't mind, one or two from some listeners. So here's one from, from Andrew. Hello, Marty and Moog. It's Andrew here. I know you guys love all different sorts of cars, but I'm just wondering, is there one or many cars that you guys just would never put your hands on? Oh, that's a good one. We've got to be careful. Mainly, I've got to be careful because a few years ago when I said some not wonderful things about a Nissan Micra, I believe it was the South Australian Nissan Micra Association got in touch and they were not very happy. Uh, and um, and it's funny because some people talk about this thing called an MCM tax. And um, and sometimes we actually do see it. And I, it, it is a thing, it's turned out, that when we work on a show, uh, work on a car on the show, the values of those cars seem to go up. It's almost and when like, we say cars are rubbish, it seems their values go down. <laughs> it's almost like the interest does something to the values. Yes. Um, so well, a car that we wouldn't touch... Um, We've got to say something, Martin. Actually, you know what? I'm going to say something that I wouldn't touch because I know Marty will 
thoroughly and 100% disagree with what I'm about to say. Yep. He will disagree 100%, which I think makes it interesting. Go. The vehicle that I will not touch nor have anything to do with is a boat. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just want. I don't understand it. I, I don't get it. I like sailboats. I used to have a Hobie cat, a little yep. catamaran. I'd go out and whatever. Boats and boat engines and and the whole boaty community. And I say that to trigger Martin what because you Marty's uh you don't Marty's wanna, current project is a boat. You don't want to bring out another thousand. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Blow another thousand. Um. Oh, I, I don't know if I should say something really controversial. Yeah, uh, nah, should I? Of course. All right, here's the thing. Don't... I, I'm i not that interested... Is it about one of the cars that I own, though? No. Okay, we'll go for I'm it I'm just... Then. People who have been watching for a long time, and we get asked this a lot. It's like, why don't you work on yeah. a Falcon? Why a don't Commodore. you work on a Commodore? Mm. Mm. And you know what? That's a really good question. But there's something about them that don't grab me. They're made in Australia up to, you know, whenever recently. Like, that's great. And they, they're always a thing. When I was growing up, they were all taxis. So I'm not that excited about taxis. Marty's looking at me with a scared I'm, look in his I'm, eye. I'm a bit because scared to we say know it, but it's the truth. What's going to happen to the inbox after this? But what I can tell you is that I think, based on this conversation now, yep. Rusty, I reckon we're going to have to do it. Oh, we will. Yeah, we we whatever Ooh. I resist, I run to. I try to, like, <laughs> seriously, whatever I resist, I realise I need to go to. And so there's been a lot of resistance about doing this. Look, we did the HQ. Like, that was interesting. Um, we've got an LS-powered Sylvia. But Mate, I I'm think all Martin, for the Holdens and I'm all for the Fords. I just the Commodore and Falcon thing. I can't get taxi out of my head. That's all it okay. is. I just can't get taxi out of my head. And I know there's some amazing Rusty, ones. Rusty, you've got us in so much I know, trouble. he's just like, mate, oh what God. are you saying? He's just going to delete That's this. Andrew. Goes, That's check Andrew. out Rusty's new <laughs> podcast where the guys reveal the one kind of car they'll never no, work on, no. which is probably the most loved kind of car in the whole in country. Australia. P.S. Moog hates boats. <laughs> <laughs> All good. One from, one from Richard here. Boys, if you could be any one other YouTuber, could be Cletus McFarland, who would it be? Uh, I know who I'd be. I'm, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I know who I'd be. I'm not even joking. Strap yourselves in. I'd be Marty because what? he's got the video skills I've got, the music skills, I'll just be honest. I reckon he, like, he's almost there. I'm just going to say, yep. you know, he's, he's, he's got solid music skills, but his mechanical spills, skills are far superior to mine. And so a few times when I'm stuck and I need help, I call him and go, can you help me? I wouldn't need to call him. I would just be Marty, fix my own stuff, and I'd be fine. But then you wouldn't there be able is. to hang out with you because you'd be <laughs> me. I know, Marty. And that'd be but, boring. But yeah, And you'd, th- just go, you'd just go and buy farm. When I was mechanically stuck... I would be Marty because there's no one else on YouTube that would be able to help me with anything that I actually cared about. I love you, Martin. You're all right, mate. That's that's yeah, that's good. I mean, I was just going to say I'd like to be Uncle Roger, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> do you know Uncle Roger, no. Rusty? So he's a chef that reviews other yes. chefs, um, and um, it's 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 very okay. funny. It's, Honestly, his, I wish I had, I wish I had more time in the day to watch like more YouTube. There's so much good stuff out there. There's, I mean, we've been around for a while now, and we've seen lots of trends come and go. The stuff that seems to stick is when people have those really like strong personalities. They got their idea, they do it really well. They don't have to like stir the pot and say that Commodores are shit or do mm. anything like that. They just sort of get on with it. And yeah, there's some really good stuff out there. I don't know what YouTube on. I'd, the, keep in mind, Greg, the term YouTuber didn't exist for most of the time we were doing this. Neither did the term influencer. Yeah. This is all oh, new stuff yeah. that's been labelled on us afterwards. Yeah. And I've kind of gone, oh, so whenever anyone says YouTuber or influencer, I'm like, oh, what? Marty, have you ever referred to yourself as either an influencer or a YouTuber? I never have. Oh, I very rarely even say if I meet someone new that I'm, I, I do YouTube because even then you get confused. What looks. do you say, Martin? I usually say I'm a, like a dolphin waxer or something. <laughs> <laughs> Boys, can we end with Polish the dolphins with, uh, with the future? And that's kind of a two-part question first and and i think we sort of went there in the early part of the podcast discussion the future of automotive generally be it uh be it electric cars be it automation you know people have this great fear of a, a white fridge turning up at the at the front door to pick you up and ha- having no personality no modifications etc that's called a volkswagen golf <laughs> <laughs> But they're really good at what they do. The future is now. <laughs> I just can't see that, right? Because people are going to always want to personalise, aren't they? Well, you know what? I think about this all the time. I'm really interested in this side of things. So I'm going to limit my. I'm going to set a timer for like a minute. Otherwise, I'll talk for all day about uh-huh. it. Um, I think it doesn't really. But we talk about Jeeps, Daihatsu's, Commodores, like all Teslas. these, all these different cars. We've already mentioned them in this episode. And I think also sometimes people get so attached to what powers it. 
And and this this fantasy again comes back to what I said about the memories they have of that car, not the car itself. If if you thought back twenty years ago that was a really good time, and the car didn't make much noise, and you plugged it into a power socket, it's not going to really change that your feelings about it. And I think people get really tribal about going, well, I only like petrol, and I only like diesel, and I only ever have a Ute, and I'll have this. Technology marches on, technology changes. You're not riding a horse. You're not driving something with a car anymore. Most people aren't. And I think it also will push it in more into the fringes and more into the niche of you are going to have your methanol-powered drag car that's only allowed to go to racetracks anyway, and then you might drive to work in your electric ute because guess what? It gets more range. It costs less to run. You don't have to breathe in the tailpipe emissions, blah, blah, blah. you got solar on your house. Like We're in the, very much in this flex, 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 fluxy stage of working out, working it mm. all out, and it's all very new. And this early adoption of people like, you know, trumpeting, oh, I love Teslas and I don't ever drive this. Is like, I, got, I, don't, I don't really care about that, but I am interested and always have been interested in where the technology takes mm. us. And I think it's going somewhere good. I think the cars are fast. I think they're fun. I think I don't have a problem with it. Whether it's powered with a petrol engine or electric engine, if it's really fast, I'm probably going to like it. And I think more people will start to understand that the more they drive. I have driven quite a few electric cars, fast ones, home-built ones, Teslas, all that stuff. And I really, I just think it's cool. I'm not at all bothered by any of it. There was a lot of resistance to shoes (laughs) when shoes came out. There was. There was a huge amount of resistance to shoes. It was incredibly controversial (laughs) where the shoes were from, where they were made, because there is a pure form of transport. (laughs) Rust is broken. broken. Rust is done. (laughs) There was a very pure form of transport, which is that you walk around and you get hard feet, you harden up your soles and you walk and... And then people started going, let's strap a bit of something to our foot. Actually, let's get some technology that can make people run faster. I haven't read kind of any of the stories of Nike or how these kind of shoe brands came about. A lot of controversy about how shoes should be made, the technology that's involved in them. And a lot of people kind of went back and go, I'm just going to do pure transport, barefoot. A couple of years ago, it was a huge thing. It was. They'd run on rocks and then they'd get a hole in their foot and they'd go, ah, now I can't run for a week because they didn't use the technology that was available to them, which was a shoe. So I think that shoes, posty bikes... And cars, EVs or not, still, I'll go back to what I said before, I think it's about what they can do for you and where they can take you and the community that comes around that. I understand that people think that they're boring. At the same time, my grandma was one of the first people in Launceston to get a washing machine. And everyone from all around came over and a lot of people, they weren't happy about it because they're like, you do it by hand. You need to do it, you need to do it. And she's just like, well, I've got a machine and I throw it in. Now, it's interesting that you chose the kind of the white good analogy because in a way, I think cars eventually are going to be a thing that takes you to a place to have the adventure and maybe the car itself will be less than less of the adventure because what is an adventure in a car? I'll tell you what it is. It's driving through a couple of states in a Holden Chimera because what happens? A wheel falls off, you stop, you meet people, you run out of petrol, you've got to get help, you've got your roadside assistance or whatever that is. The most exciting things that happen are normally the things that can go wrong on an adventure. And I think as we get more connected, more controlled, more range, more EV, less of those adventures are going to happen, but you're also just going to get to where you need to get to safely and then run without shoes on and tread on a piece that's of glass. Really and if I can just add as well, so I did a road trip in a Tesla and you do have to stop and charge it and everyone's like, oh, that sucks. I can fill up my diesel ute in three minutes, not 30 minutes like you have to do in that Tesla thing. But then some of the best memories I have from that trip is like where we stopped and who we spoke Agreed. to and where we went and what we went got food went hung out and did this and did that and you know drove around and and then looking that the total cost to get where we went was zero like yes it had to come from somewhere and you know when i look at a big charger and it says 80 kilowatts has gone straight into a car from the sun you're like that's kind of cool i want to conclude all of this by saying everybody should right now go and buy a car turbocharge it go to the track and do a massive skid (laughs) uh because that is also there is let's just be honest martin we can talk about the efficiency of evs all day there is nothing like doing a big skid and hearing your turbo whistle and just dropping rubber all the way down Uh, it's like let's let's be because on one hand you're driving the fridge and on the other hand we need to drop skids yeah i'm see i'm all about somewhere in between i'll drive my my quiet thing that's solar powered to the track and then i'll smash that car all day and then drive it back and charge it up again anyway yeah like I said, a good talk all day about this. But I think it's a very interesting space, so we'll wait and see what it's happens. It's changing whether we like it or not because the government's going to make the change. Um, uh, EPA emissions, all of it's going to change. Um, live in the new world or die in the old world. Eventually, it's going to be clamped down so much. I reckon it's just going to be like 
Australia's Wonderland. You can take your old car to a special little town that looks like a town, drive around, someone comes out and gives you a flat tyre so you can change it and have that experience of what it used to be like in the olden days. Soon cars aren't going to break down, there aren't going to be flat tyres, this stuff is not going to be a thing. It'll be sad, but only for those people that were alive at it. Anyone that grows up natively with this won't even know what they're missing out on, just like we don't know what it's like to ride a horse to school. Best example I can give you, and I'll finish with this, is... I went to a car meet. There was all these awesome cars. There was new stuff, old stuff, classic stuff. It was it was amazing. And then in the back corner, there was a bunch of dudes standing around, all had white hair, in front of their stationary engines. What's That's that? my oh, st- like tractor engines. No, it's a stationary engine. Like it's an engine you build to run a yeah. pump in your farm or something. And it was a big deal. Stationary engines. Oh, was from all back different. in the day. Yeah, from right. like the twenties or, or earlier. And and did no one care, Martin? Is that what you're well, saying? Well, this is the thing. This is what I found interesting. The bunch of old dudes who built them, they loved them, and you could see the craftsmanship, and, no one and else that cared. was amazing. There was a couple of younger people sort of interested, but they got back in their cars and drove home and didn't think about it again. It's like it's 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 important. It's part of our history, and it's it's exciting at the time. But yes, as you say, now people plug in a freaking eight volt battery and pump mm. their damn dry. You know, like it's. Think things have moved on, but um, yeah, there's still so much exciting stuff to do, and just should just get in and actually do it. Start a project. There you All go. right, do some. Stuff. All right, <laughs> we've had the Commodore revelation, which I think is fantastic, very funny. Um, can we get from you? You've worked on Grail cars. More recently, you've been doing some very cool stuff with little Utes and so on. Uh, is there a car that each of you in the future would like to get into Super Garage and work on? The maybe you haven't had the chance to do that yet. Um, I would like to get a classic car, a well-known, universally accepted classic car, and do an electric conversion. Cool. That's what Very I would like cool. to do. The, call, call it whatever you want. That's all I'll say about that because it's already Good in job. the works. Good job. Marty. Um, uh, I feel like I'm not done with uh, like sports cars yet because I've got a couple of like you know little Toyota Yaris, Geo Yaris we've got's great for track days. I really like my Subaru wagons. You know, dual cab utes are handy. I've got my little funny weird sort of nuggety you gotta you get know, something fast mirrors and, and super turbos and yeah like I'm, I'm still pretty keen to do a really cool two door coupe of some description I haven't quite worked it out yet your machete yeah like a, a machete car and, and the big one that's that, that's no secret that people know is coming up is I've got a two door STI um, which I bought just pre-COVID before the prices went nuts um, but of course it blew an engine because it's a Subaru and, uh, and I'm really excited about getting that working again and just having that sort of that hero car because I really like those Boys, thank you so much. We've shot the breeze for um, nearly an hour and a half about all kinds of things. I'm sure we could do a lot more of that. Um, Great stuff on some of the crazy mods you've done along the way. Awesome to think um, that you've more or less touched all corners of the the globe with a a pure love of adventure and, and modifying cars. I know there's lots of great stuff in the in the pipeline to come. Congratulations and well done. Rusty, thank you so much for having us on your podcast. And again, thank you so much for being super knowledgeable about the kind of the car scene in general, but also just doing your research about what we're doing as well. It actually really means a lot to us because normally, what's your favourite car? <laughs> oh, okay, thanks. That's it. So um, it, it was really cool to be involved in your podcast. So thank you thanks so much. Thanks for coming on. And of course, if you want to learn more about what we're doing, you can check that out at MightyCarMods.com. Uh, all the videos are free to watch there on YouTube and you can have a look. There's hundreds and hundreds of videos and a new one comes out every week. Uh, Rusty, thank you very much. Well played, boys. Rusty's Garage is written and presented by me, Greg Rust. Series editor and producer is Ed Gooden. Audio production by Link Kelly. If you've got a guest suggestion, get in touch with me via social media. The Garage. It's where a journey begins with a tank full of passion-fueled stories. Yeah.